So right when we left off last time, we, we had gone through the actual potential and we discussed the actual potential characteristics, things like uh, all or none principle, and then this idea of self-propagation. Um, so really that ends the, the content on forming action potentials and the neuron, which is the main cell that generates action potentials. And what I want to finish up with here is I want to discuss how we go through and support the nervous system. So the nervous system is comprised by and large by these cells called neurons that run from the brain and the spinal cord out into all of the periphery of the body. But the nervous system has to be maintained. There are a couple cells that help to maintain, a couple different types of cells that help to maintain the normal physiological function of the nervous system. Those cells collectively are referred to as neuroglia, or sometimes you'll hear it neuroglial cells. So the neuroglia are going to be the cells that help to protect and help the neurons function. And there are a couple different types of neuroglia. The first type I want to introduce you to is a cell called the Schwann cell. And Schwann cells are actually going to wrap around the axon of the neuron. So you'll remember that the axon is a part of the neuron that runs out into the, into the organism that comprises primarily the nerve. And what we do with these Schwann cells, you can see them shown here in blue, is we take that whole cell and we wrap it a whole bunch of times around that axon. In fact, so much that the nucleus kind of gets pushed up into one corner of the cell on the exterior. The rest of the membrane here is just wrapped many, many times around that axon. So the Schwann cell is just the wrapping of the membrane of that cell around the axon. Now, when we do this, when we wrap these individual Schwann cells, and you'll see that we have multiple Schwann cells that will run down the length of the axon, and we'll continue with that picture extended further. And the reason that we do this, well, first, um, before I move on, collectively, individually, we call them Schwann cells. Collectively, a cell that has all of the Schwann cells down the axon is called a myelinated fiber. And this forms what's called myelin, or the myelin sheet. So we put these cells around the axon called myelin. And what you'll see is you have the cell, and then you have this area where there's a small little gap. And in that gap, you actually have membrane that's exposed. So we form alternating exposures of neuron. So little patches of neuron outside of the protection of that myelin or that myelin sheath. Those areas that are exposed, so we have exposed membrane that ex is exposed into the um, extracellular fluid, that's called the node of Ranvier. <coughs> I know it looks like it should be pronounced rain here, but it's actually named after a Frenchman who discovered these inner nodes in, in the nodes. So it's the node of Ranvier. Now, by doing this, by creating an axon where you have the Schwann cells forming what are called inner nodes, and then you have those patches of exposed membranes in the node of Ranvier. 
what you are actually doing is you're insulating that neuron. So it acts as an electrical insulator. If we were to pull this light switch apart, pull the wires out, we would see that there was plastic all around the wires. And in fact, what you would find is there's a wire in there that's black, with a coating of black plastic, and one that's coated with white, and then the exposed bare copper wire. And then the whole thing is wrapped up in another piece of plastic. The plastic is an insulator that helps you improve the efficiency of moving electrons through the copper wiring inside of your home or in a building. The same thing and the same principle applies here. By insulating the axon, by wrapping the axon up in these myelinated cells or these Schwann cells, we are actually preventing leakage of our ions into the surrounding fluid. And so we're increasing the efficiency by which we can move the electrical signal from one point to another down the axon. And actually what you're going to find out is that not only does it improve the efficiency by acting as an electrical insulator, but it actually increases the speed of transmission. So we can actually increase the speed by which we move the signal along the axon. In fact, the speed of a myelinated fiber to move an action potential from one location to another is so much quicker than an unmyelinated fiber that if we want to use uh, or if we want to keep track of um, things like putting your hand on a hot burner, we are exclusively going to use this super fast form of uh, axon signal using the myelinated fiber. That type of signaling is called saltatory conduction. Saltatory conduction. So here you can see an example of why saltatory conduction is so much quicker. And what you'll notice is action potentials are only generated, ion exchange only occurs at the node of Randier. There is no action potential forming here at the inner nodes underneath the Schwann cells. So I greatly reduce the action potentials that I have to form. Because remember, with action potential, we have that self-propagation progression where this patch of membrane undergoes an action potential, causing this patch of membrane to undergo an action potential, causing this one, causing this one. Now I get rid of large chunks of the membrane where the action potential forms at the patch and then we have this signal that gets sent really quickly through saltatory conduction by repelling the positive sodium ions underneath the, um, the inner node. Okay? So we have a collection of sodium ions right here. And as that action potential proceeds down the node of Ranvier, we have increasing positivity here. Positives repel positives. So that sodium that's underneath the inner node is repelled. And that repelling motion or that that factor that repels those positives from those positively charged soda, sodium ions from one location to another location happens really, really fast compared to creating an action potential as I move through the patch of membrane. Okay? So really what this saltatory conduction looks like is the signal is jumping from node to node to node. You see an action potential here, no action potential here, and then action potential here again. So it looks like we're jumping from node to node to node as we move along this um, as we move along this neuron. Everybody, you know Newton's cradle. It's, uh, a lot of times people have them on their desk. It's got five hanging balls and you release it and force transverse through. And that's really what kind of is happening here is you have the positive change that occurs at the at the node of Ranvier, and it repels really quickly the, the sodium ions underneath that Schwann cell to affect the next node of Ranvier. And so that signal just jumps along. And that's really, really fast. Thank you.
So that depolarization jumps from no to no. Now, when I say really, really fast, we're talking about speeds of like 50 meters a second. Meaning you can finish a 100 meter dash in two seconds. So that's really, really fast. We also have some neurons that actually are not myelinated. They just have a single cell that wraps, it's, or a, a cell that wraps around multiple, um, multiple neurons and axons of those neurons. So instead of having the, the cell that's wrapped all the way around like this, you have a single cell that just kind of encases individual axons. And it just kind of has a single layer. These do not follow the saltatory conduction, and these are more like two meters per second. So that same 100 meter dash would take 50 seconds. So you actually can move faster walking than that non-saltatory conduction. But the saltatory conduction is super fast. Moves that signal from one location, say here in my quadriceps, all the way up to my spinal cord, almost instantaneously. So if I step on a fire or a big spike, it's not going to be a long time for that signal to eventually get there and then set that signal back on. Ouch! By then, I probably done so much damage to my foot that it might be irreparable. And if I was a ancestor of ours 2,000 years ago and I was a hunter gatherer, and I need my hands and my feet, I'm pretty much dead now. I had a bunch of guns off that path. So, very, very important to have neurons that follow the saltatory conduction pattern so that I can respond very quickly to noxious and to um, signals that are potentially damaging to my health. So, the neuroglia, in particular Schwann cells, help to regulate the speed of transmission and insulating the speed or insulating the transmission so we don't have a great deal of loss. Once we get down to another tissue, and we've already actually seen interactions before. Anyone remember where where we've seen a neuron interacting with another type of tissue? Yeah, the motor unit. To be able to cause muscle contraction, we have an interaction between that neuron and that muscle. And what you'll remember, anyone remember the neurotransmitter of muscle contraction? Acetylcholine. So you have to release acetylcholine, and that acetylcholine release is stimulated by an electrical signal. You have the action potential that comes down, causes calcium to rush into the cell. That calcium causes acetylcholine to release into the synapse, the space of interaction between those two cells. This is basically the way that it's done with all of our other interactions. Not just between the nervous system and muscle, but between nerves and other nerves, and nerves and all of our other tissues. So our interface is always going to be called a synapse. And in some cases, we'll name that synapse something special. In the case of muscle, it was the neuromuscular junction. And on the muscle side, we call the neuromuscular junction on the muscle side of the motor inflate. It's still just a synapse. It's just a specially named synapse in that case. And the synapse is going to have a very similar physiology or a very similar anatomy, rather, regardless of what type of tissue we're dealing with. You're going to have this bulge that forms that we're going to call the synaptic knob or the synaptic bulb. And it's going to be loaded up with these vesicles containing neurotransmitters. And those neurotransmitters are going to be stimulated to be released into the synapse, which you can see happening right here with this particular vesicle as it opens up and through exocytosis, deposits those neurotransmitter molecules into the synapse, increasing neurotransmitter con uh, concentration in the synapse. And then on the postsynaptic membrane side of the interface, their interaction, you have receptors. In the case of muscle, it was the acetylcholine receptor. In other areas or other interactions, it may be a different neurotransmitter that's being released. It could be things like dopamine or serotonin if they get released across that, uh, across that synapse. So on the nerve side,
we have the synaptic bulb shown here. And then we have that small gap. So we have that small gap between our cells. And that small gap is filled up with extracellular fluid. I mean, this is basically outside of the cell, surrounding, surrounding the cell. That small gap is frequently referred to as the synaptic gap, or more accurately, the synaptic cleft. And that synaptic cleft is where the neurotransmitters are going to be deposited into, uh, into the area from the, uh, from the neuron to affect this postsynaptic cell. Now, in order to release these vessels, vesicles containing uh, the neurotransmitter, I want to do it only when I need to. Right? I only want to release the acetylcholine when I want my muscle to contract, or I only want to release substance P when I want to feel that when I want to, when I can experience the pain. So the way that this works in this membrane here, so the synaptic membrane or the the, the membrane of the uh, of the neuron, in that membrane of the synaptic bulb we have calcium channels. Now these calcium channels are going to make that membrane permeable to calcium. Keep in mind that outside of the membrane versus inside more calcium out here in the extracellular fluid, low amounts of calcium inside of the cell. So I've set up my concentration gradient, right? How is calcium going to move when I make this membrane permeable to calcium? So it's high out here, it's low in here. So it's going to rush in. Calcium rushes into the cell when these calcium channels open up. Now, if you had to take a guess, how am I going to open those calcium channels up? I'll give you a hint. I have my nerve impulse or my action potential coming down into the synapse. These calcium channels are bound up in the membrane. I have a change in voltage coming down. These are probably what type of channels? I think I heard voltage gated. That just simply means that the channel is going to open up, that cell is going to become permeable to calcium when we have a change in voltage that can be brought on by a nerve impulse or an action position. So we can open that gate or we can open up that channel. when our action potential arrives here in the synapse, changing the voltage of that membrane fluid or that intercellular fluid in the, uh, in the synapse, calcium channels open up. So then what begins to happen is those calcium channels open. Calcium rushes into the cell. As calcium rushes into the cell, We're changing the concentration of calcium in the intracellular fluid of the bulb. Now, also notice that we have mitochondria located in the, uh, in the synapse. Those mitochondria are going to act as my energy powerhouse. I have a steady supply of ATP into the synapse. 
that's going to help to maintain everything that's in here. I'm also going to use that energy to help take these vesicles from their storage location to dock up to that presynaptic membrane. So I have vesicles that contain neurotransmitters, and as calcium rushes into the cell, being made to rush into the cell because the voltage-gated calcium channels have been stimulated by the arrival of the action potential. That increase in calcium through a series of molecular mechanisms that I'm not going to go too much detail into here, other than to say that the increase in calcium allows mechanisms at the molecular level to help take that vesicle and move it to this membrane down here, which I'm going to call the presynaptic membrane, it's before the synapse or the synaptic cleft, and helps to dock it up to that membrane. So it comes up and it fuses with that membrane, and then it begins to open up, and the neurotransmitter pours out into the synaptic cleft. So the neurotransmitter enters the synaptic cleft, and now I've increased neurotransmitter concentration here in the, in the synapse. On the other side, so this is going to be called the postsynaptic membrane. In the postsynaptic membrane, I have some channels that are chemically gated. So if it's chemically gated, they're not going to respond to a change in voltage, but they're going to respond to a certain chemical. And hopefully you guess that that chemical is going to be the neurotransmitter that's just been released into the gap. This chemically gated channel is usually associated with the ion sodium. So we're going to call it a chemically gated, chemically gated sodium channel. The chemical, again, is the neurotransmitter. That neurotransmitter, when it binds to our chemically gated sodium channel, causes that sodium channel to open. Now, when that sodium channel is open, sodium high up here in the extracellular fluid, low inside of the cell. Sodium will rush into the cell down its concentration gradient. So we rush sodium into that postsynapse cell. And that postsynapse cell, as it increases sodium concentration, it's becoming more positive, it's depolarizing. And as that cell depolarizes, that change in voltage causes other ion channels, sodium and potassium, to open up. And we generate this thing called a graded potential or a local potential. As we create this graded or local potential, we disrupt this postsynaptic cell's resting membrane potential. Before all this began, this cell was probably at about minus 70 millivolts to minus 90 millivolts, depending on the tissue that we're talking about. All of this happened, action potential comes down, calcium rushes in, neurotransmitters released, interacts with the sodium, chemically gated sodium channels. Sodium rushes into the cell, we begin to depolarize that cell, disrupting the resting membrane potential. This membrane is now performing work. 
Now, as long as that disruption of the resting membrane potential is strong enough, which what would be a strong enough impulse? What do we have to reach? Remember the name of that, of that thing that we had to reach in order for an action potential to go? We have to reach threshold. So if it's strong enough, and that voltage change reaches threshold, we open a bunch of other ion channels. And we generate a physiological event. It could be another action potential that's generated, or it could be another physiological event, such as muscle contraction. So that is the end of the nervous system chapter, chapter 11. You know how everything goes next. Are there any questions? I'll see you my eyes. <laughs> okay, so if you got questions, please stop by. Um, I'll be around a little bit today, quite a bit tomorrow. And you can always call me or send me an email. So we're going to start with some new some new material here again. We'll be on the next exam. This is going to deal with the urinary system. Okay, so the urinary system is going to help to maintain homeostasis. And in particular, helps to maintain homeostasis of the blood. So every time you are uh, urinating, every time you excrete some urine, you're actually excreting a modified form of your blood. It's been processed quite significantly by the urinary system, but it's removing the water component from the blood to contain uh, waste products and excessive ions and things like that. And that's what you actually are going to urinate out. So we're trying to maintain the levels of those different chemicals and different waste products in the bloodstream for optimal performance of the blood. So the urinary system, in order to maintain homeostasis, is an excretionary system. So we have a lot of excretion that occurs. And that excretion is to excrete things like excess water. If you have too much water in your blood, it either begins to fill up in your tissue in a process called edema, which isn't really that good, or it can remain in the bloodstream, increasing blood pressure, which isn't that good. So we're going to use the urinary system to get rid of excessive water to reduce the likelihood of buildup of fluid in the tissue and uh, high levels of blood pressure. In removing the water, we're also removing dissolved materials. Some of those dissolved materials will be certain types of waste products. So removal of certain waste products, carbon dioxide in small amounts, excessive hydrogen protons, nitrogenous waste from the utilization of protein and the breakdown of proteins. We'll also have removal of certain solutes. We have to maintain things like calcium and sodium and potassium and chloride. And you consume all of those in your diet. So you're putting them in from digestion. Sometimes you get excessive sodium. And we want to get rid of some of it. And so we'll actually deposit it as a solute into the urine through the 
uh, to the urinary system and allowed it to be removed in that fashion. So we're going to get rid of water that's in excess. We're going to get rid of waste products, especially the driving this waste, and we'll get rid of certain solutes that we're trying to keep balanced for optimal function of all of our different physiological systems. Now the urinary system actually works in conjunction with other systems. And we've already mentioned one of them, the digestive system is going to be input for a lot of these materials that need to be balanced out by the urinary system. So the digestive tract itself, when you consume food, maybe you go to the cafe this afternoon and you have a nice juicy hamburger with some french fries and load those bad boys up with some salt. You can stream that salt into your uh, into your digestive system. The salt makes its way into the blood, and you have a spike in your blood pressure because that's what happens when you increase sodium into the blood. And we don't want to have high blood pressure. We don't want that to persist. We want to bring it back down to our normal. So we begin to excrete that sodium. So food and water or beverage enter through the digestive system, eventually make their way out into uh, into the bloodstream and then are going to be regulated by the urinary system. Now when you consume food, and when we get to the digestive system we'll talk a little bit more about this, but when you consume food, some of it is excreted, doesn't even make it into the bloodstream. So you have some food residues that you consume that are not digested, things like insoluble fiber, that sort of stuff. But some of it's digested. And the process of digestion is followed by a process known as absorption. Digestion is the breakdown of the food. Absorption is the retrieval of that fluid, of, the, of those molecules from food into the circulation. And so you begin to circulate these different foods and some of them have to be excreted because we get too much of it, too much sodium, too much nitrogenous waste and we get rid of it through the urinary system. So we kind of have this balancing act on one side, you need to consume food, one, because it's really fun to consume food, but also because you need to consume food for survival. But sometimes you take too much in it, we don't want to keep it in, so we get rid of it on the other side of the urinary system. The urinary system also plays nicely with the circulatory system. Now the circulatory system, when the nutrient is in the bloodstream, it circulates it and it may get distributed to cells where it's going to be utilized. So the circulatory system, in its process of of distribution, that's supposed to be distribution. Let's try that again. In this process of distribution of material, solids, and fluids to the cells, is going to deposit some of those nutrients to cells where they're needed. And so the circulatory system, working in conjunction with the digestive system and the urinary system, is a point of removal for some of these solids, reducing the level of sodium or other solids in the bloodstream. Primarily, we're moving macromolecules. And we're moving, well, uh, macromolecules, by the way, carbon, um, carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, nucleic acids. We're also distributing oxygen and carbon dioxide. Coming in from respiration. 
by the way, in this respiratory process, we're, we're, we're basically, the, I hope you see what I'm doing here. I'm trying to show you the picture of here's the blood. The urinary system is going to regulate the blood and how much sodium, potassium, nutrients are in the blood, waste products are in the blood. But there's all these other systems that are also affecting the bloodstream as well. Circulatory system is distributing some of these nutrients into the cells so they get removed from the bloodstream in those cells. Respiration. We also have some of the water that's actually lost in respiration. When you breathe out, you breathe out some, some water. And that's water that no longer has to be regulated by the urinary system. Bloodstream is also going to send some of the toxins that build up from metabolic processes to other locations, such as the liver, where the liver metabolizes and breaks down those toxins and converts them into less toxic or even um, non-toxic byproducts. Blood also distributes water and salts to the sweat glands, and some of the salt is released through the skin into under the surface of the skin. It's here also that we have regulation of temperature. And by altering the temperature of the blood, we actually alter some of the volume and pressure characteristics of the blood. Now, everything else that's not handled by any of these other systems, exchange of water and salts through our sweat plants or distribution of toxins to the liver. Everything else that's not handled, if it's outside of those homeostatic limits for that particular molecule or solute or nutrient, it's going to be regulated by the urinary system. So everything else, all of the water and the solutes and the waste products that aren't neutralized or distributed by any of these other systems, end up at the urinary system. So the urinary system is basically that final checkpoint to say, sodium levels are high, let's excrete sodium. After all of these other systems that have their chance at balancing out their sodium or nutrient needs. Make sense? So really when we get down to it, all the other systems are dealing with distribution, they're regulating distribution. The urinary system is regulating input and output. During that distribution you have some collateral damage, so you have some loss or utilization of some of those materials. It's going to be the urinary system that on one side regulates or helps to regulate how much is going to come in and gets rid of all of the excess that hasn't been used or um, distributed by those other systems. So the urinary system has the final check on regulating blood volume, what's the water content of blood, and the hydration requirements of the organism. Okay, so blood volume, how much blood is present, and then hydration requirements, how much water is present in the remaining organs or the valves of the remaining organs. Your kidneys are going to be your central organs to the urinary system. They are found in the thoracic cavity or near the abdominal cavity, um, border with the thoracic cavity, uh, just below the liver, 
The stomach is going to be in here as well. Large intestine circulates around there, so it's in that abdominal cavity towards the back, towards your towards your spine. And those kidneys have tubes that run down, called ureters, that run down to the urinary bladder, and then another tube called the urethra that is going to leave the body. And it's going to be formation of urine here, relocation of urine to the bladder through these tubes, and then relocation of urine to the urethra to the external environment, hopefully keep your toilet around the urine. The kidney, if we take a cross-section through the kidney, is basically where all of the urine formation happens and how we pull the solution from the blood that eventually will become urine and how we modify it. It's all met here inside of the kidneys. So the kidneys are referred to as the gatekeepers of water. The kidneys have the ultimate authority on how much water will remain or be removed from an individual. So as a gatekeeper of water, the kidneys are constantly regulating water gains and losses. And really regulating in terms of balancing everything out. So you'll remember that we have loss when we breathe. So every time you breathe, you lose some water. Your skin, you're also going to lose water. So all of these are taken into account, all of these effects, and I'm going to label them out here in just a second. All of these losses are, are going to be balanced out by then production of urine, by the urinary system. So that breathing, every time you breathe, you lose a little bit of water. We call it an evaporatory loss. You have no control over whether or not you're going to lose water. I mean, I, mean, I guess you can try to stop breathing, but eventually you'll pass out and you'll start breathing again. So you can't prevent this loss. And it's typically, for an individual at rest, roughly about 500 milliliters per day. So breathing, you have that evaporative loss, it's about 500 milliliters per day. The skin is also very dynamic. And the skin dynamics result in another evaporative loss. that accounts to about 350 milliliters per day. Now you're probably thinking sweating, which is a good thing to think here. But even at rest, you have the sweating that's imperceptible right now, all of you are sweating, even though you don't realize it. You're not, like, not really. You're actually still sweating. It's imperceptible. It's such a small amount. And it's helping to maintain the acidity of the skin, the acid mantle, that's part of our first line of defense in the immune system. It's also helping to regulate your body temperature. You also have another uh, form of evaporative loss from the skin. And it doesn't work real well on these tables, but the tables in the lab, maybe you've been in there before and you put your hand down and you pull your hand up and you can see your hand mark. That's not from sweat. That's actually from this process called cutaneous transpiration. You have sweat that's coming out of the sweat pores in the skin. You have cutaneous transpiration, which is fluid directly out of the skin. And when you put it on a cold surface like the slate inside of the lab, it actually will collect up and it, it will leave that kind of imprint that's left over. So those both account for about 350 milliliters of loss every day. Be thankful that fecal material also produces some loss. You didn't lose an absorptive loss of fluid here. It would not be a very pleasant operation. 
So there's going to be some of the water absorbed directly out of the bottles into your pickle material helps to ease the process of going. Counts for about 150 milliliters per day. So if you've done the math real quick there in your head, if you counted one liter, 1,000 milliliters from these three losses. So we have this one liter loss from all of these other systems, their normal metabolic activity. Now we're also going to have gains. And for the most part, the gains that occur are because of your decisions. Now, you do have some pretty heavy prompters for you to make some of those decisions. Like, I'm thirsty, I'm going to go get some water, I'm going to go get something to drink. Or I'm hungry, so I'm going to go get something to eat. So typical gains, based off of your decisions, you decide when to drink for the most part. You get promptings, obviously. And you decide when to eat, and you also get promptings there. From the fluids you drink, the average human consumes about 1,000 milliliters per day. Wasn't that losses? And I messed up my notes here. Yeah, I forgot to put a one in right here. I should have put a one in right there that said losses occurred in various organs and systems in the so, kidneys are gatekeepers of water. They regulate <coughs> H2O gains and losses. The losses occur in various organs. So, breathing, skin dynamics, and fecal production. And then the gains are by our decision. We choose to drink fluids, and it's on average, about a thousand milliliters every day. Then we also have water that comes in from food. And that's actually even a little bit higher for most people. About 1,200 milliliters per day. And you might be thinking, what? Get more water from my food? I'm going to do like a really nice dry cup. Right? We like food that's succulent and, and has a high water content. Now, it's not directly a decision that you make, but it's based off of the decision to consume food and water. You have an underlying metabolic process that occurs as you break this food down and utilize it to produce ATP. These are both referred to as preformed water, what you drink and what you consume in food, and then you have metabolic water that's produced. So if you're up on your biological chemistry, you'll know that at the very end of production of ATP, you have oxygen that accepts electron at the end of the electron transport chain to generate water. This is what we're talking about here. So as you produce ATP, the big take home message, as you produce ATP, which is required for all of your metabolic processes, you generate water. And it's not water that comes in, it's actually being produced by you. And we typically produce from these underlying metabolic processes approximately 300 milliliters per day. So if you go through and do the math real quick, 
you'll find that it's two and a half liters that is consumed or produced per day. And so now we have a little bit of an imbalance. Obviously your decisions will often vary. Sometimes you eat more food or drink more water than other days. You also may exercise, which may increase some of the substantial losses. So the decisions often will vary that alter the other processes. And so even though I'm giving you one liter of loss, two and a half liters of gain, these are just rough estimates. They're not complete gospel truth here. So what I'll leave you with here today, give you the cliffhanger, if none of this is regulated, we're going to have an imbalance. And you all will blow up like a bunch of water balloons. More water than you get rich. So we'll pick up there on Friday.